if you're into watches, and I'm guessing you are because you're watching this, you probably have a few watches on your list that feel unobtainable for some reason. Perhaps it's because of cost, or the waitlist, or because of the cost to circumvent the waitlist. In any event, these become grail watches that you keep in mind over the years, with the idea that someday you'll be able to hunt one of them down. But what happens if you can get hold of that grail watch? Should you? Well, this is my story of hunting down one of my grails, the Vacher and Constantine Overseas Chronograph, reference number 5500V. And it all started in January 2016 with a picture on screen now from Deployant's article on their pick of VC's new overseas line. Believe it or not, I had this as a wallpaper on one of my computers ever since. I just love the blue dial. Now, while the watch debuted in January 2016, it took until the end of the year before I was actually able to see it in the metal. And by that time, I just bought a different steel sports watch, so I wasn't able to pull the trigger just then. But over the years, I've always kept tabs on this watch. I noticed that this blue dial variant was getting really popular and getting really hard to get hold of. But this year, I sold the other watch I just spoke about, and I was thinking about what to get as a replacement. Um, the authorized dealers locally said, well, you're out of luck, I'm afraid, mate. Um, the blue dial is now only available through the boutiques, so I started thinking about getting it pre-owned. But the prices there weren't that different to that new price. So I wandered into the, the local boutique, and I was really surprised to learn that they had a blue chrono in stock, and that I could buy it. Brilliant. One quick transaction later, I had the Grail watch I'd been tracking for about five years. So happy ending then? Well, yes. But it doesn't involve me keeping the overseas. While there's a lot to love about this watch, there are a few issues that I just couldn't live with. What were they? Well, let's unbox it and find out. So let's get to it, shall we? As you can see, it's a fairly standard cardboard box from the outside. But as you open it up, you can see it's a little bit special because the in inner box is protected by its own cloth overlay. We'll get back to the box in a second. But what's left in here? Well, in this little box here, there is the instruction manual, and we've got the Geneva seal and the warranty card. So turning back to the main box, you can see here, it's a lovely lacquered box. On the top there, we've got Vacheron, Constantine, and gold lettering. And there's also the uh, Maltese cross pattern, which you'll see all the way through both the box and the watch. And there's the watch itself. First impressions are that the dial is just as lovely as I expected. And I mean, just look at the way it plays with light. It really does look fantastic, doesn't it? Is there anything else in the box? Well, let's take out the tray. And as you turn it over here, you can see they can actually store two watches in this box, which is a really nice touch. Underneath the tray, there's the two extra straps that you get. The first is the blue leather, and the next is the, the blue rubber strap. And these work with the deployant clasp that's provided. But you only get one of those, and it'd be much better if they gave you two. Only other thing in the box there is the spare links from the bracelet. Okay, now let's look at the watch properly. The dial really pops, doesn't it? Now it's a big boy, this watch. It measures 42.5 millimeter diameter, uh, close to 46 across the diagonal, 51 mil lug to lug. And so it just about fits my 17 cm wrist, about 6.75 inches. Any smaller, and I think you'd struggle. So just like most chronographs, press the top pusher to start the big seconds hand. Uh, once that's moving, you've then got a 30 minute indicator and an hour indicator here as well. Once you're done, you press the button again and to reset, you lose the lower screw down pusher. So you put it back to zero. So the watch head is 13.7 millimeters thick and the screw down crown along with the screw down pushers help to provide the watch with 150 meters of water resistance. Now, excuse me a second while I foot it with the screw down crown to get it locked in. And it's time now to play with the dial again. The different treatment of the central portion and the almost tile like outer ring really makes the dial sing when it hits the light, as you can see. So let's take a quick look at the bracelet. So it tapers down quite steeply after the first link, and that leads to the butterfly clasp, which is really well done and it feels really solid on the wrist. And the bracelet does come with a 
really clever micro adjust system which gives you around five millimeters on each side. In essence, you just pull the bracelet a little to open up the adjustment and a simple push puts it back in. So how do you remove the bracelet? Well, it's a fantastic integrated bracelet, but one of the selling points of this watch is the fact that you've got two other straps as well and it's easy to change. So how do you do it? Well, there's a little button there, that hopefully you can see, and you press that button and push in a 45 degree angle away from the watch head. And there you go. Really simple. And it was the same on the other side as well. So let's take a look at the watch uh, away from the bracelet. Fantastic, isn't it? And let's have a quick look at the movement. And the, the level of finishing here really is remarkable. And apologies, I'm selling this watch. So the sticker on the back is still in place. So how do you put the straps on? Well, I'm going to demonstrate that with the rubber strap here. So as you can see, they've got the same quick release quick on buttons on the end facing the case. And that's surprisingly solid when it's attached to the case. And here's a deployant clasp. The little hole in the middle acts like a keyhole. And one of the straps has the key in it. And basically what you do, there you go, is you push that into the keyhole and you twist it into place like so. Unfortunately, as you can probably see, this connection is a bit in the floppy side. So now to connect the straps to the watch, so it's basically the same in reverse. And as you can see here, it can be done in a matter of seconds. Try doing that with the Rolex. That's never going to happen. So now the rubber straps on the watch, let's have a look at it on wrist. Now it does feel really comfortable and really secure, but a few tweaks to the deployant side of the watch would elevate it to being excellent. And here it is back in the bracelet, very easy to do. And the bracelet itself is really well finished with that Maltese cross device integrated throughout. So let's have a quick look at some loom here. You can see that there is loom. It's a sports watch that so should have that, but in keeping with APs and Patek's sports lines, the loom isn't brilliant. In all fairness, I think this is better than Patek's on the Nautilus. It doesn't last that long, but when it's actually charged up by the sun, it really glows really well. So it's now time for a few macro shots, I think. And you can see that the case is really well finished, as are the dial and the hands. The watch really does look fantastic when you're looking at it face on. And the mixture of the polished and brush surfaces and the transition between them are really well done as well. It's really sharp and clear. But there's a niggle here. The watch itself is only a few days old, and you can already see dust accumulating in those cutouts, as you can see here. And as I said, I've only had this watch for a few days, so that really does suggest that this watch is going to be a bit of a dust magnet. So I've only had this watch for a few days, and I'm already talking about selling it, even though you've heard most of the comments I've made are pretty positive, and none of the niggles I've mentioned seem to be a deal breaker. So what's the problem? Well, for me, the main issue is noise. Well, I can live with rotor noise and the rotor noise here is pronounced due to the ceramic bearings that the watch has. I'm not willing to live with a watch over 30,000 USD that is almost as noisy as a Timex. What do I mean by that? And what I mean by that is that you can hear the watch ticking really loudly in certain situations. Now, to be fair to VC, you can't hear in all situations, but it's the first time I can recall ever hearing a mechanical watch ticking when it isn't right up against my ear. In fact, while it probably isn't quite as loud as a Timex, it beats four times as fast. So that when you do hear it, it's a lot more annoying. Well, at least for me it is. The other issue that I ran into was that the watch didn't keep time as well as I would have expected. In the time I had it, it just about stayed inside the Geneva seal parameters, but only just. And for me, if I'm spending that much money on a watch, I want to make sure that it's at least as accurate as a Rolex. So given the noise and the lack of accuracy, buyer's remorse set in and I started to look for a replacement and how best not to lose too much money in selling the VC soon after buying it. As luck would have it, a basically new Patek annual calendar was available and I was able to swap the VC with a top up to get it. So far, no regrets in making that trade. So that's my story. What do you think of the Chrono? Would you have swapped it? And if so, what for? Now, if you like my review, please comment and consider subscribing. It would help me a lot.
Thanks very much for watching.